Well, good evening, everybody. Um, as, as introduced, I am Getty. Uh, this is Trevor. We are both uh, people who work at Stripe on Sorbet, uh, which is a static type system for Ruby. Uh, the specifics of what that is we'll get into in a moment. Let's start at the beginning. What is Stripe? Stripe um, is a platform for building businesses online. This means mostly payments. Our bread and butter is our uh, payment services. We have a handful of other services to help businesses. Um, things like like Atlas or, or, or uh, Sigma or like analytics platform. Uh, Stripe is at this point a pretty large organization. Um, we are more than 2,000 employees spread across the world. San Francisco, Seattle, Dublin, Singapore, Paris, um, uh, Chicago, there were a hand, I can always, I forget them. Um, we are hiring, incidentally, um, although I am told that all of the interviews right now are remote interviews for various reasons. Um, Stripe is a big company. Uh, Stripe, it, because we have a large number of developers, has a team that is the developer productivity team. Um, what is a developer productivity team? A developer productivity team is a team that is supposed to break down obstacles to product engineers working on product. If a product engineer is focusing on something that is not specifically related to what their job is, then we have work to do. Uh, what This can take a lot of different forms. Some of those forms are language agnostic, some of them are language specific. Um, for example, within Ruby, we have teams working on things like Bundler and various other tools. We're the team that maintains the linter. We're the team that maintains the CI. Sometimes this even means digging into our code and building abstractions for other people to use. If there is an abstraction that is particularly buggy or particularly slow or does not abstract well, uh, developer productivity might work on that. Um, you know, we run various test things. The, the fundamental goal is if our, our developers are not focusing on the product, then it is our job to fix that. Uh, Stripe is also a major Ruby user. Uh, it is our primary product programming language. We have a handful of other programming languages at Stripe. We use a handful of Python here, a little bit of Go there. Um, by and large, uh, all else being equal, uh, someone will be programming in Ruby. Hundreds of our engineers program in Ruby. We have all of our Ruby code in a mono repo um, that amounts to millions of lines of code. There are thousands of changes to this mono repo every day. So we don't just use Ruby, we use Ruby extensively and at scale. So something that developer productivity does every six months or so, actually many teams do this, but developer productivity, uh, we do a survey. We ask everyone in the engineering org, what are we doing well? What can we do, be doing better, et cetera, et cetera? There's all sorts of questions. And one of, the, when we did this, this is, would have been a couple of years ago at this point, we kept getting these very consistent pieces of feedback about the process of developing. There were three major pain points that just came up all the time. The first one is just, it took too long to get feedback um, about the code, about changes, about writing things. The second one is that going into an unfamiliar part of the code base, it took too long to get familiar with it, to understand what was going on. And the third was that it was way too easy to accidentally break things. Um, all of these things are important for this talk, but we'll come back to them a little bit later and explain in more detail um, what they're about. But given those things, there's a couple different things that we could do. So we evaluated our options. Um, one option is nothing, because these are, to some degree, inherent problems with writing software. Unfamiliar software is going to be unfamiliar no matter how you cut it. Um, sim you know, sometimes it's going to be hard to test things. This is, we have been struggling with these for decades. But on the other hand, it's very clear that there was a problem, and so that would be you know, that would lose productivity. That would be us not doing our jobs as developer productivity. Uh, we could treat the symptoms of code, because the other thing is that this could be a symptom of the fact that our abstractions aren't as good as they could be. Um, you know, why do you care about unfamiliar code on a regular basis? Maybe we could split it apart. But again, this, is, this isn't a solution that scales. This is fixing an individual, individual problem and not fixing it sort of across things. We could, we could do various rewrites, um, and rewrites are always large. They're gonna require large numbers of people. Um, it's not, you know, and, and the other thing about rewrites is that you can't 
do half a rewrite and have solved half the problem. You need to rewrite it and solve the problem, or if you don't, then you've just wasted all of your time. But one of the other things that people realized was that many of these things are problems that typed languages do not have in as great um, a sort of con concentration. Unfamiliar code, it's harder to use it wrong because you have contracts with types that ahead of time tell you how that code is supposed to be used. You can look at the types to get hints as to, well, I know this parameter must be this, this parameter must be that, data must flow in this particular way. And one of the great things about a type checker is it's not going to take that many people to write, and in a couple of months we can evaluate. Um, and if it turned out to be completely useless, we've wasted three months of three developers' time. Um, so what did we do? We wrote a type checker. Um, this, uh, the process of writing Sorbet is r roughly looks like this. October 2017 was when the project kickoff happened. February 2018 was when the first typed code entered our monorepo. Uh, in this case, our team was responsible for building this in. We d this project was still an experiment. We did not know if it was going to be complete or successful. We uh, would, well, and by we, I actually mean not the two of us because we both joined after this, but we in the, the general broad sense, uh, the Sorbet team would add types to code and get reports of when it failed um, silently to us. This was not part of the standard CI. This was a thing that we were sort of adding in dark mode because we wanted to evaluate it. By the time that it touched other developers, we wanted to, uh, we wanted to know that it was going to be useful. And early on, uh, we wanted to, you know, refine the types, refine the interface, and so forth. Um, we exposed it shortly after that. By June 2018, it became a mandatory step. In order to get code into PayServer, you needed to have it type uh, pass the type checker. Um, We'll see a little bit about uh, Sorbet encourages gradual adoption. Individual files can be opted into uh, Sorbet, so they start um, typed false and then move up in typedness levels as they go, uh, which meant the fact that this was required for every file did not mean that every file had types. This just meant that the files that did have types had to pass the type checker. The other ones could still be gradually untyped. Um, during the time that is uh, marked lots of other stuff, we were adding more type signatures over time. Also during that time I got hired, I liked that event, that was nice. Um, we were um, you know, building more abstractions. That was, we also uh, started a beta during which we onboarded a number of other companies to use Sorbet internally, see what broke for them, see what worked for them. Um, these companies, some of the big names included uh, Shopify and Kickstarter and Gusto. Um, and then in uh, June of 2019, we uh, released this as open source. So of course you can, if you want to go try using it right now. So given that, let's look a little bit at what Sorbet actually looks like and how it solves these problems. So um, if you remember, we were talking about the survey that developer productivity runs every year. And the, you know, we had these three themes that were showing up, you know, that it was taking uh, too long to grasp unfamiliar code, that it was taking too long to get feedback on changes that you were making, and also that it was really easy for well-meaning developers to accidentally break things. So um, why don't we look, look a little deeper at, at those specific themes. So here's an example that was pulled almost verbatim from the Stripe code base. Um, it's been shortened a bit just so that it fits on the slide, but you know the basic structure and idea is, is the same as the, the function that, that lives there. Um, so let's say that for some reason we find ourselves looking at this method and trying to understand and debug it. Uh, we were pointed here from a stack trace that we, we got through an alert, um, and now we have to try and understand it quickly. Just looking at it like this, we don't really have much in the way of tools to, to understand this method in isolation. Um, so some examples of that are if you look at the merchant parameter, it's hard to tell. You know, is this going to be a string or is this going to be an instance of the merchant model. And it, you know, in Stripe, you might know, oh, well, this is likely to be a string or a merchant model just because of you know, its kind of domain-specific knowledge. Um, additionally, what if we wanted to change this? What if, what if we thought that it needed to be a merchant instance? You know, now uh, we need to, to try and figure out um, whether or not we need to actually load that merchant in this method or whether or not it's already a, you know, a merchant instance that we're getting in. Um, Similarly, if we, if we look at the next line where uh, the fetch method is being called, uh, 
the line underneath that is defaulting that similarity data uh, variable to be an empty array. And so we might wonder, is this, is this doing that because nil might signify that there is an error that we actually need to handle? Is it, is it falsy just because uh, you know, maybe that's what it returns when there's no record for that merchant. You know, it's, it's very difficult to tell. Um, and so these are all uh, instances of things that show up all the time in a, in a large code base. And what we'd really like to do is to kind of facilitate a quicker understanding of, of why these things exist. Um, going on to the, the second point, which was that it takes too long to get feedback. Uh, Stripe believes strongly in test-driven development. And as, as a result of that and having uh, a rather large code base, we have uh, just hundreds of thousands of tests. And this will take uh, many days to actually run if you run it all on your laptop um, in CI. Due to uh, a lot of hard work by developer productivity, it will run in about 10 to 20 minutes. And uh, some recent work has pushed that down uh, into the kind of five minute range, uh, optimistically. But what we would really, really like is to be able to give feedback on the order of you know, one keystroke. So as you're typing, you're getting immediate feedback as to, to, to what is or is not wrong with your program. Um, the third point about it being too easy to break things, so going back to the example, imagine that we did want to change a uh, merchant now to be an instance of the merchant class. Well, so, so we make that change, we go through and we update all of the call sites to pass in a merchant instance now, and we might find those call sites just by grepping through the code base. But, you know, there could be any amount of metaprogramming going on that's actually updating that or, you know, introducing calls to that method. It could be that we have code generation that's writing out calls to that method. It could be that we're using send to call it uh, by, you know, initializing the name from some variable. So there are a lot of different ways that we can end up with, with uh, calls of that method that don't actually now uh, respect the contract that we are kind of assuming we're putting in place. So... It might be enough that our tests pass, or it might be enough that we have run it on QA. It might be enough that we have canaried the, the build out to a select number of servers, but it's kind of difficult to really feel confident in that change. Um, so now you might be wondering, does Sorbet actually fix these things? Uh, and so why don't we walk through a demo just to see um, basically what that, what that workflow is like. So one of the things that we developed while working on Sorbet was sorbet.run, which is a website that runs in your browser a version of Sorbet. And so the really nice thing about that is that it means that we can embed it into the slides as an iframe. Um, so here we have, we have Sorbet running in the iframe, which is really great. So this is our same method again, and then a bunch of scaffolding code underneath it just to, just to kind of motivate it. Um, and I will say that uh, normally you would have all of this in a bunch of different files, but here it's all just in one because that was the kind of convenient way to structure sorbet.run. So um, the question that we had initially was that we didn't know what merchant was. And so one of the things that sorbet allows us to do is if we click this fetch method, or sorry, if we hover over it, I think. I need to click into that. Yeah. Here we go. It'll pop up this little window that has uh, the signature for that method which is giving us uh, a little bit of information here that merchant is actually a string, or at least that it's expecting merchant to be a string. Um, and then we can scroll down and actually read the documentation associated with that method as well. And so here you can see, oh, returns nil if no similarity data has been uh, registered for this merchant yet. And indeed, you can see the return type says that it is a nilable array. So that's one way that we can also validate um, that the thing that was happening here, where it was... Uh, it was defaulting that similarity data variable to be an empty array is actually the right thing to do here because you know, there wasn't obviously an error that we were, we were trying to handle. Um, additionally, if there, if there wasn't any type information present, we could just right click this, right click the, the method um, call and then go, click go to definition. It would take us right down to the definition of that method. So if we didn't happen to have a type signature or documentation available, then we could just jump right to the method and start reading it to get an idea of, of you know, what that variable was and how it was being used. Um, so the next point that we were talking about was that it, it would be nice to be getting feedback quicker than, say, even five minutes optimistically. So if we introduce an error here, um, you'll notice that Sorbet updated immediately. And now we have these red squiggles underneath that, uh, that method call. 
So if we hover over it, it says method FET does not exist on uh, the similarity DB module. Uh, and, and so this is, I mean, so the, the nice thing here was that you immediately got that error message. And I will say that uh, you, you do get that same level of responsiveness even on a code base of millions of lines uh, of code. And so what we can do here to, to fix this is just start typing in the name of the method that we actually want, which is fetch. And if you'll notice, Sorbet immediately suggested a method that we could cho choose to, to complete here. So additionally, there's this little, uh, bu little I button here that we can click to go back and get that exact same information that we got from Hover, which will tell us, again, the signature of the method and the documentation. Um, and so what we can do is just click on it to complete, and it will automatically fill out the argument list substituting in the types of each argument um, for it positionally. So we can then just fill this back out to get back to where we were before. Uh, and everything's good again. So the last thing that we might want to do is after, after learning a bit more about this method, we might want to try and improve the state of the world for others. And so for Sorbet, that would mean um, adding a signature so that we kind of propagate this information outward. So the way that you do that is to just write sig above the method and then fill out the parameter and return type information. So um, one of the nice things that Sorbet can do for you is just suggest a signature. So here, um, it's taken the information that it's, that it's gleaned from the body of the method and kind of propagated that out to the merchant parameter name and also the return type of the method. So we can see here that now it says, okay, merchant must be a string and it's going to return a similarity record. And so the nice thing about this is that once you've added that signature there, it will propagate that out through the rest of the code base and give you errors about where you might be calling this method and not satisfying that contract. Um, if you use Visual Studio Code, you'll find that it will just uh, pop up a little, um, what, like a, a panel that has all of the errors listed, and you can just click on them and jump right to them and you know, fix all the errors that you found. Um, so it's a, it's a great help in refactoring because, say, if we wanted to push that change through where we were changing this to an instance, we would change the type from string to instance there, and it would immediately tell us all the places that it knows about that we need to go and update. Um, let's see. All right. So just to go back to that list again, um, Sorbet improves our ability to grasp unfamiliar code because immediately types give us the ability to know things about um, you know, what, what values our parameters might inhabit, what uh, what parameters other methods that we're calling are expecting to take, um, you know, what return types might be. Uh, it's very responsive and gives us feedback really quickly. So, you know, we, we do still need to run things like CI. We do, you know, we do still QA deployments and things like this. But um, for immediate feedback, it's really invaluable to know that you're calling the method with the right parameters. Um, and finally, uh, Sorbet is just another great tool for helping to reduce uh, brittle code. You know, if you're getting feedback uh, this regularly, um, it's, it's much easier to have confidence that you're not going to accidentally break something when you deploy it. So with that, I will hand this back over to Getty. So the last thing is about where, you know, so we've open sourced, what, eight months ago or so. Um, and, uh, but Sorbet is still going. It is still an ongoing project. Uh, one of the things that's very exciting, um, and this has been, you can uh, watch the talks at, um, I think that this original announcement came from Ruby Kaigi last year, but there have been variations on it at various talks. Ruby 3 is going to have quote unquote first class support for types. What this means is not that Ruby 3 is going to be a typed language or that it's even going to ship with a type checker. Ruby 3 is going to have a built in notion of what a type looks like, and it's going to have types for the standard library. The actual interpretation of those types is going to be left up to other tools, including Sorbet. Um, we are actually collaborating with the Ruby core team to make, to make sure that Sorbet will have support for this particular format just from the get-go. As soon as it's released, um, our particular uh, Sorbetified versions of the types for the standard library are going to help form the basis for what Ruby 3 is going to, uh, to ship with. Um, so you can definitely see details about that, not just in the Ruby Kaigi talk, but there's also a similar talk at um, RubyConf from last year um, that describes some of the details. Uh, so that is very exciting. We also 
have been continuing uh, Sorbet as an open source project. We've had a lot of activity on it, um, including from non-Stripe people. We um, were a little bit, uh, we, I, I think there's always a nervousness when you ship an open source project that is anyone gonna care? Uh, and it seems like a lot of people care. We have a lot of people who are not Stripe employees contributing uh, bug fixes, code, to the um, contributing types to the standard library and to other things. Uh, we also have something called the Sorbet typed repo. Um, so Sorbet ships with the types for the standard library directly embedded into Sorbet. But for a lot of other common gems that don't necessarily have sub Sorbet support built in, it's nice if there is sort of a, a standard place where you can say, well, here's the types that we expect this to have. So there is a repo um, called Sorbet typed. It's, you know, github.com slash Sorbet slash Sorbet typed that has types for existing gems. Uh, most of that has actually been external contributors who have been contributing uh, types for the gems that they use, the gems that they, they want. Uh, it still needs a lot more. If any of you start using Sorbet, we would welcome your contributions. Um, uh, we have a number of different gems in this repo by now. We also have a lot of other projects that are cropping up. So Sorbet Rails is one of them. Uh, Stripe is not a Rails user. Stripe is, I think, one of the you know, kind of rare in the, the Ruby world for not using Rails. Um, and so when we shipped Sorbet, we did not have built-in Rails support, and we were kind of worried about, oh, well, we're going to have to do this at some point probably. What is this going to look like? Someone else came in, just did it all for us. Um, it's spectacular. Uh, this is uh, Harry Doan at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative who has done all of this. So if you look up his, his blog, his work, um, he's just done spectacular work in this. There's also uh, like Sword. If you already have yard annotations, Sword helps you take those and turn them into Sorbet compatible signatures. Um, Sorbet plugins are a thing that Sorbet um, does not fully support all Ruby metaprogramming because how could it? Uh, there is a degree to which uh, there are certain abstractions that we looked at and said, this is going to be difficult to support statically. We're never going to be able to reason about this particular kind of dynamic method generation. So instead, Sorbet uses plugins. We have plugins for a lot of the uh, standard kinds of metaprogramming that you use, your adder readers and adder writers and things. Um, but there is also the ability to have plugins to Sorbet that can handle other bits of metaprogramming that you might want Sorbet to support. Um, we've also got a lot of good feedback, both externally and internally. This is kind of us being celebratory a little bit, but we can't help it. Um, you know, people say things like, having types is so amazing. I'm refactoring a lot since everyone has gone, gone, and I can finally get real work done. It's saving me a ton of time in comparison to test. I did a big refactor in a sorbet project, and I miss it so much already. Um, one of the things that we are working on very heavily now is the editor tooling. So the sorbet that you saw is the editor tool, and you can still use it in a batch mode where you just run it against your, um, your entire project. Um, but our v, uh, we have a VS Code plugin. It is not currently open source. You can kind of use the existing Sorbet. It has an LSP server in it. Uh, and so you can run the LSP server against your editor of choice as it stands. But we have extra functionality built into our VS Code plugin that um, <laughs> we want it to be perfect. <laughs> Wait, wait forever for it to be perfect. Oh, you're wait, wait a couple of months. Um, uh, and so thing, but things like the go to definition and find all references um, are, are things that we have in VS Code. Um, so that's going to be a big, that is our big push this year, is getting that to the point that we feel like it's stable. We're adding new features to that all the time. And the plan is to open source that sometime this year. Um, uh, the you know we things can change, but that's the plan. Um, and Sorbet is still a work in progress. We're still working on making it faster if we can. Uh, we it's pretty fast. It runs on our millions of lines of code in about a dozen seconds or so. Um, but hopefully we can make it even faster in places where it matters. And we're still implementing language features. We've been relatively. Um, conservative about adding type system features because we don't want to just add all of the type system features and turn it into a mess. So we've been very much doing things slowly and on demand based on how much they've cleaned up our code, the need for them in in our particular mono repo, the call for them by other people. But that doesn't mean, you know, that we've implemented everything. 
um, it is still a work in progress. And so hopefully um, it keeps growing. Um, and uh, for that, it would be great to have your help. If you would like to try using Sorbet, you can use the, uh, the little uh, online editor right now. If you use it in your phone, you don't get all of the fancy features. It's kind of hard to mouse over on a phone. Um, but you can use it from your phone right now if you want to. Um, go ahead and try out sorbet.run. It's got a bunch of uh, examples. And uh, let us know if you have any questions. It is written in C++. Um, it also, so Sorbet also has both a static and a runtime component. The static component will run offline over your code, and that's the part that's written in C++. The runtime component is just a gem. It does some honestly incredibly disgusting metaprogramming uh, to add um, type checks at the beginning of every method and at the end of every method. We at Stripe use the runtime because we feel it, if you didn't use the runtime component and you had some types that were wrong but you didn't realize it, uh, you could end up with code that just does very anomalous things at runtime. And so we include the runtime component. So is it actually like shimming in logic that like at every call site it's like, are the types okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, you have the ability to either turn it off on a per call site basis or turn it off via other configuration. We've heard from most of the other um, industrial users of Sorbet that they tend to turn it off entirely in production and just keep it on in CI and tests. At Stripe, we tend to keep it on um, e even in production because we like the extra assurances that it gives us. Um, but there are particular call sites where we do turn it off because sometimes it can be, um, so it can be very slow sometimes. We actually have it, it pages our team if it takes too much time. Um, <laughs> And I think it's like, what, 5% or 7% of the runtime. If it, if it hits that, then it pages our team. Um, but um, yes, the performance impact is present. But um, in our case, we think it's worth it for that extra guarantee. But um, there are other people who disagree. So it's, it's not clear to me as a newcomer to this what, what an optimal workflow that that use Sorbet in the workflow, what would that look like? So we've got a couple of different ways that it shows up. Um, you can, uh, you, it, it's a part of our CI. It is a mandatory, so whenever you push code to um, a server, it'll start a Sorbet run. That run tends to get back to you in a matter of seconds. It's one of the first um, thing, you know, one of the first reports that you get back from CI. Um, that means that we prevent people from merging code that does not um, type check. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it is, it al we also have it as a um, optional continuous local process. This has to do with some of our local tooling, but even if you're not using VS Code, you have a effectively, um, I'm trying to think, what would you call it? What do you call our pay? It's sort, it's like, of, sort of like a REPL, it's you know, a series of local servers that you mm -hmm. have running that kind of give you yeah. continuous Looking feedback. Looking over your shoulder. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Is, that, is yeah. that like what the VS Code plugin talks to, is like a local server that... The VS Code does talk to a, a, the, local, the sort of running survey process. Yeah. And all, and but there's... Has like a huge table of all your types for all of your Yep. Yeah. Oh yeah, it literally has all of the files in memory, it has to. So the um, workflow for an individual would include that? Uh, it could. It's a primary way to get through the eye of the needle later on. It could. It definitely, I think that that's probably a reasonable thing. Uh, if you wanted to have it entirely CI, uh, you could do that, but you're going to have a little bit slower turnaround in getting things. Excuse me. Um, so we are using it in production, um, mm -hmm. and it's awesome. We've already caught some bugs. I'm well, awesome. Sure. This is a thing that we are still working with, and I don't think that there's any plans right now, but we know it's a pain point because we have it too. Everything kind of 
I don't know that there's necessarily a one size fits all approach. Um, so like, like for, for, for testing metaprogram things, um, I think it, it very much has depended on the thing. Like, I don't know that I can say like, okay, here is, here is the one approach that we have taken that has been the correct one. Um, I will say as far as metaprogramming, um, we have a concerted effort at Stripe to use less and less of it. We've actually been switching a lot of metaprogramming over to do um, to code generation. Uh, we have parts of our step that generate code from particular descriptions because for one, then you can just look at the generated code. Another one is we tend to find that this performs better because uh, this performs better because the Ruby VM can just load, okay, here's all the methods. And it tends to be better at, you know, know okay, when, you, when it knows that there's a finite set of methods as opposed to having other ones defined at runtime, uh, we tend to have better things. So one of the things that we've done pretty extensively is taken things that used to be um, various dynamic metaprogramming and generate code that just has types already. Um, because now Sorbet can actually look at the, the bodies of the methods and whatnot. This is a lot of work. Like this is not this is not the solution. This is just a thing that we have done in places because it has had other advantages. There are other places that we will do unit tests around particular abstractions. There are other places that we do integration tests. Um, and I don't know that any of them has been sort of the solution other than that we have been trying to move away from metaprogramming internally when we can. Um, and that you know that's only the solution because we think it's good for other reasons. You, you have that thing. Does that give you uh, like the ability to take advantage of more like uh, JIT kind of things by not using that part? Uh, in general, yes. Yeah. So. yeah. so the the Ruby VM does tend to JIT better when it just knows ahead of time what all the methods are, as opposed to the dynamic ones. Uh, talk to us about generics. Where did it start? Where is it? Where is it going? Generics exist in Sorbet. They are deliberately undocumented because we have been nervous about whether they are the correct generics. Um, if you actually go to sorbet.run, you can see um, the, you can look at examples of generics. We have two different kinds, which is sort of the, an awkward thing, um, because we have a different um, sort of syntax for doing generics on an individual method level, like param you know, type parameters to a method versus a generic class. Um, but we had to include both because both are necessary to type different abstractions. Um, it's just kind of unfortunate that they have like two different notions of type variables depending on whether you're talking about a class level generic or a method level generic. Things like this are one of the reasons why they're, we, we consider them to be a little bit unstable. At the same time, they are necessary for typing the standard library. Um, they are pretty well integrated into our code. I doubt that they are going to change in an earth shattering way, but who knows? As, as someone who's like completely an outsider within the Ruby community, I saw something on there that I, I didn't, didn't recognize, but I know, I know that there's kind of this thing where evidently they're including this in Ruby 3. Mm -hmm. so what is the approach there for you know basic stuff like generic arrays or dictionaries or something like this? And how are you guys, like, what does that process look like? Um, so we are still working on that. The, there is a, um, is the, I don't know if the, the, the type syntax, is that a public GitHub repo? I don't know. It's, it's just a doc off somewhere in Google Docs. I don't know if it's public. Oh, well, there was a repo that Sotaro was working from. Oh, yeah, his repo probably is public. Yeah. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so this is still a little bit of in, influx. Um, what that exact syntax is going to look like is still kind of being developed. Uh, we have monthly meetings with them where we talk about the ways in which it's developed. Um, one of the interesting things about that is that it deliberately does not necessarily have a blessed semantics. Um, and that's one of the things that's actually sort of a little bit of a challenge here. Python has a similar history. So Python has a module in its standard library as of 3.5, maybe 4, called typing. Typing has a bunch of types in it. Those types do not mean anything, except in as much as they are given meaning by something like MyPy, which is a project that has, you know, a standalone type checker for Python, um, very much like Sorbet. Uh, it can give particular semantics, but there are ways in which these semantic, you know, Python itself does not has not necessarily given a singular blessed definition to. 
I don't know where Ruby 3 is going to land on this or not. Um, this is... I guess just to hit the nail straight on the head, like Ruby's arrays support things like pulling stuff out and putting stuff mm -hmm. in. So like how, you know, what's the conversation around covariance and covariance types? Oh, like, yeah. So we, we had to make wanna... them... <laughs> we had to make them uh, covariant to be able to type the existing code. So the, the API necessitated having covariant arrays in that case. So, you know, there are... Um, a few kind of blessed uh, standard library classes that are allowed to have covariant data. Um, other than that, uh, class generics only permit uh, uh, invariant uh, type members. And um, uh, interface, well, like modules can have uh, contravariant or covariant parameters, but then you're restricted to where they can show up in type signatures. Sorry, so it's. When you, when you say generics, do you just mean like arrays that can have any number of different kinds of things in them? Um, no, we mean specifically arrays parameterized by the, the type of, of thing that they hold. So an array of ints or an array of strings. Okay. Uh, and yeah. the covariance. Sorry, that, that, well, that's okay. It's, it's uh, related to subtyping. So when you're, when you're asking, is this thing a subtype of an array of ints, then it, it talks about how um, the subtyping relation applies to the type parameters there. Yeah, so if you, have a, uh, if you have an invariant type parameter, then the only thing that you can put in or take out are things of the, that exact type. Okay. Um, so this is important in part because very famously Java got this wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> are we going to end up in Java or are we going to end up somewhere else? In our case, uh, yeah, we kind of ended up at Java. Yeah. But, um, but that was because of, you know, we had to type an existing set of code that, that okay. used them covariantly. Uh, mm. like, like C sharp. Yeah. yeah, and maybe, I don't know the answer to that, honestly. That would be a thing that we are still, you know, we, that we, we, we do have ongoing conversations with that team and okay. they're, yeah. I think our next one's tomorrow. Yeah. So, um, effectively, so Java got, the, the famous thing is that Java got this wrong. Java treats, uh, if you have, you know, to use the classic example of like a cat is a subtype of an animal, then Java treats an array of cats as being a subtype of, of an array of animals. This can be a problem because if I pass it to a method that takes an array of animals and adds a new dog into it, well, that's valid because an array, you know, dog is a subtype of animal. So if I have an array of dogs, I can put an animal in it. But if I have an array of cats, I pass it to that method that now puts an array of dogs in it, which is also allowed because an array of cats is a subtype of an array of animals. Uh, then now I have my array of cats has a dog in it, and you know, the world is broken. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's just complete nonsense. Um, in this case, it's just very hard, you know, covariance and contravariance are concepts that are hard to reason about. Um, Have you had any, like, pushback, like, uh, against it just because, you know, like, Ruby is a dynamic type language, and mm. I think adding types to it, you know, uh, might make it less buggy for some users, but it takes away some more, like, the... Readability, mm -hmm. initial readability. Like, I'm just kind of curious what, what has been like the criticism or. Uh, so, the not every team has taken to it to the same degree. Um, because we didn't, we didn't mandate, oh, alt code. We, we mandated that typed code had to be typed correct. We did not mandate that all code had to be typed early on. Um, and so some teams loved it, and some teams were more ambivalent about it because it is this extra thing that you have to do. Yeah. Overall, I think that engineering at this, like part, part of the thing here is just scale. A lot of the really nice dynamic things that you can do in Ruby are great when it's a relatively small team and you can all communicate with each other. When you're trying to deal with code written by someone whose name you probably don't even know, who is you know, uh, three or four teams away on the other side of the planet because they're in the Dublin office, um, all of a sudden, you know, having this sort of these sets of rules and standards and whatnot that get enforced by a type checker end up being very valuable. Over time, we found that people end up really liking it because of what it enables, things like this really fast turnaround, like these sort of fearless refactors and whatnot. Um, but not everyone loves it to the same degree. Um, you know, some, some people we found do write personal projects in Ruby where they use it and are excited to. Some people don't. Some people don't, you know, think of it as, okay, well, this is an unfortunate consequence of our, you know, it being a big corporate environment where you're working with hundreds of people. Um, 
not everyone has necessarily come to it with the same fervor, but I think overall the overall at least at stripe the the feedback has been very positive because I think that what it enables you to do like you you're giving putting more restrictions in some places, but you're getting a lot more freedoms in terms of other yeah. places um, and you're getting a lot of tools that you can use and I think that people have been very positive about those tools. Uh, Yes. Yeah, we don't um, effectively, so the, the three that we care about are false, true, and strict. Where false means, a uh, survey will still report some errors in a fault, typed false file, but the errors that it reports tend to be of the form like, you have referenced a constant that does not exist. Um, it will not check any types, it won't do anything else. True means that it will check types. Um, importantly, if you write a type signature in a typed false file, Sorbet still cares, like still reads it. It just doesn't, and it will still check it if you then use that method in another file that is not, that is type true or above. Um, uh, type true means that you have, to, that it will type or check these types. Type strict means that it will be an error if you omit types from anything that uh, can be typed. So if you do not have types on every method, every constant, every uh, instance variable uh, that would require a type. There's also two other levels. There is ignore, where Sorbet does not even try to read the code. Um, that can usually be a problem, because if that defines a class that something else uses, then Sorbet will not know about that class. And, uh, and then there is typed strong, which is sort of an aspirational goal at this point. Uh, strong means that every intermediate step has to have a type. You can't have a, so Sorbet has a type called untyped. Untyped just means it acts like Ruby. Uh, untyped, a value that's untyped can have any method called on it. That method is treated as taking any number of arguments of type untyped and returns a type called untyped. Uh, you can always opt out of a type at a given call site too. You can always say you, there is a method called unsafe. Unsafe just returns untyped. Whatever it's given it returns, but it returns it as though it's untyped. Um, so if you are still using metaprogramming, then Sorbet does not stop you. Uh, it's just not going to help you as much. Uh, and so you can, and this is great for gradually adopting, sometimes you just don't want to get rid of it and you just keep using unsafe, you keep using typed false, or you use type true and don't care about the fact that some of these things aren't typed. Oh, you had a... So, uh, just, I, I assume it's a yes, but like for anonymous functions, It does. Um, anonymous functions have some limitations in terms of the argument types because we have genuinely not figured out how subtyping works in the presence of things like anonymous functions with keyword arguments that aren't fully specified and things like that. Um, and so there are some limitations around. Um, but if you just have like, you know, a two argument proc that has, you know, these things, then absolutely survey. Mm. Like yeah, okay. yeah, but yeah, we yeah we absolutely handle lambdas, procs, etc. And so all of that, like within method bodies, it's like all inferred, right? It's all inferred, but it's all forward inferred. So it only does. Um, so sometimes, for example, if you have a, a variable whose type changes, uh, you might need to um, give that an explicit annotation. Um, because it doesn't like look at the entire method body and then infer types. It infers based on just like if you define a local variable, the right hand side, it has to, you know, it looks at whatever that is. So you can't kind of like reassign, it sort of gives you grief if you're reassigning a local variable all the time. Or In a loop. Uh, if you're just reassigning a local variable again, it just treats it as a new variable definition, so it's fine with that. But. And, and like how is that handled? Um, we'll get a type error that says that you're not allowed to change the type of something inside of a loop, but... Which is really easy. You just give it an annotation to be the type that you want it to be. Right. Um, the other thing that's worth it noting... It creates like a shadow variable specifically for that loop, I guess, at that type, for the, with the annotated type. Well, uh, yeah, I guess commonly if you're doing that, it's probably because you're communicating something out of the loop. Right. And so, in that case, you can change the type of the original variable to be, you know, um, like the original type or this other type. So we, we support some types and so. You, okay, so that was gonna be my next question, is like do you support like union types? Mm -hmm. 
Yep, you mean, uh, yeah, some in intersections. Yes. Yeah, so we also do, um, we do uh, flow-based type inference, and so if you check the type of a variable inside of, you know, an if, then um, underneath that conditional, it will be uh, locally that, that the type that you had tested there. Um, similarly, if you use case, then, you know, it, it will, it will refine the type for all of those underneath the branches. Uh, yes? Uh, so in TypeScript, one of my frustrations has been uh, there's a method to do with this type inference and uh, assert the type of a variable, but all of these <coughs> type checking functions have to be written by hand because mm. types disappear at runtime. Are you able to generate type assertions and, and assert the type inside the body of the branch? Um, so we rely on hijacking Ruby's existing is a method. Um, so we, we don't re-implement that, but we do uh, interpret that in the static pass. So whatever you're, whatever you're writing to test the type of something in the conditional will be the same syntax that you would use to, to perform that check at runtime. Yep. Um, so on the runtime version, and now that Ruby's been playing around with JIT, has there been any exploration into how the JIT and the runtime Some of this stuff kind of sounds like the dialyzer uh, tool from like the Erlang um, Elixir world. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was just wondering if there was any kind of prior art that was sort of <coughs> um, Prior art just for like uh, type, type checking a dynamic language? Yeah. Or? Yeah, the, I mean, so there have been a lot of um, a lot of attempts to do this sort of thing before with, um, geez, why am I blanking on the, uh, the gradual type checking is, is the kind of general field. Um, so yeah, there, there has been quite a lot of research done. I, you know, TypeScript I think is another good example. Um, but then to go back to your previous question about uh, how how the two might interact with the JIT, it should be seamless because the the code that implements the type checking at runtime is just Ruby code. So yeah, I mean, what what I would assume would happen is that the the code that is doing the type checking will end up being JITed, and you would get faster type checking when you're when you're entering the method. Going back to your question, I just wrote it. Because um, we have, uh, oh, apparently it's. <laughs> you wrote it in the wrong window. I did write it in the wrong window. Uh, I can copy it over there. That's interesting that there are two different iframes, apparently. Yep. <laughs> um, oh, oh, I'm different monitors. Yeah. Oh, that's, that is actually so here is a find um, okay. that takes an array of integers, and you asked about blocks. This is the syntax for a lambda, so that, or a, a block. So this is a block that takes an integer and returns a Boolean. Great. So this is just finding the element of the array such that the Boolean is you're going, or this block is going to be true. It returns a nullable integer because it might not have found anything. Notice that right here, this has an error. Uh, and if I do this, it says changing the a a type of a variable in the loop is not permitted. Because I have defined x to be nil. Right. If I ask, actually I don't need to do this because I have the, uh, there is a thing called reveal type that tells me what the type is. The revealed type is nil class because the type of nil is nil class. Uh, so this isn't great, um, but luckily there's an easy way to fix it, which is that I just need to say this integer, or this x is a nillable integer. In this case, nil is a valid value of nillable integer because of course. Um, and so now that I've done this, that error that was happening here about the changing the very type of variable in the loop is no longer happening. Because it turns out I'm not changing the type of variable in the loop. I is of type integer. Uh, I can mouse over it and see, OK, well, there's going to be an, an integer. And so that means that, um, so this is the one instance in which you often need to write man, an, local annotations manually, is when you are using loops. On the other hand, if this were not a loop, if this were um, just say x equals nil, and then I change it to x equals 1, then Sorbet treats this not as, even though to Ruby this is updating a variable, Sorbet just treats this as shadowing. Yeah. So that means x did have type nil class, now it has type integer. Okay. Um, but yes, so that hopefully uh, shows 
you know, se uh, several uh, of the things that you were asking about in practice. Totally. Can you rewrite mine to be generic over the array chain? Yep. You'll also see when I said that it was a kind of a verbose. Yeah. Well, I mean, it seems like you guys can trivially kind of like write like a preprocessor that took like kind of like a more terse notation of this. And oh yeah, we. Mm -hmm. um, I'll see if this needs to be. Yeah, I, I thought it was fascinating that this is all sort of. I was curious whether you added a new syntax or leveraged existing Ruby syntax. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Clearly, yeah. I mean, I think it, it, it's the right thing at the. Oh, this is going to be a right problem, now. isn't it? Oh, oh. That's mm -hmm. a big question right there. Right? Oh, is this going to be okay? Let's find out. I think it might be out of scope at this point. Yeah, I think that one's out of scope. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, Unsafe it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so no. Uh, the answer is yes, we would just not type this thing in here. Um, well, or you could implement it differently. Right? Yeah. Like, you could probably use the native filter construct. Or oh, yeah, it. which, you know, that, that is already typed. So when we said, okay, generics are kind of clunky and not finished, <laughs> we weren't lying. <laughs> this is one of the reasons that we don't have them publicly documented yet, right. even though they're still important and we still need them. Can you speak a little bit, you touched on this in a couple of different areas, but in like general trade-offs. So you talked a little bit about organizational size, code base size, um, flexibility versus, you know, knowing what type you're getting about. Can you just talk a little bit more about trade-offs and what you've experienced and got feedback from on various areas? I, we might actually be the wrong people to talk about <laughs> that. We, <laughs> So, you know, at previous jobs, we, we both were Haskell programmers, so I feel like you know, the, it's, it's yeah. a little bit difficult to see adding types as a trade-off. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I... <laughs> so... You have an internal Haskell tool that you use to generate that C++ code. Oh, no. <laughs> you guys from Galois, come on. No, no, no. We're, we're just writing C++. So yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, because I actually used to be a... Um, before I was a Haskell programmer, I was mostly a Python programmer. Um, I think that, you know, one of the nice things about, like, Ruby's dynamism is powerful. There's a lot that you can do in just a handful of lines that are kind of amazing. Um, a lot of times those things, it's not that they're not typable. It's not that they're even, you know, not typable with something like Sorbet. It, but a lot of times they have contracts that are relatively difficult to describe in a relatively standard type language. Um, one of the, you know, one of the advantages that you get in something like this is that it lets you type those things that can be easily typed here and get feedback and avoid, you know, not have to type other things, which is in many ways a little bit of a sweet spot, but of course the trade-off that you get is fundamentally there's, it's still Ruby. Fundamentally, you still have that metaprogramming going on underneath the covers. Um, that, uh, you know, the, there's sort of high-level trade-offs that don't necessarily apply here, like for example, if you were designing a new language from scratch like this, uh, something that uses some uh, gradual typing is going to be harder to uh, optimize at runtime. Because like your V tables are going to be all over the place. You're going to have to add dynamic stuff in all over the place. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, an organizational trade-off here is that I think this, this does end up getting the, uh, you know, or the, the reason that this hits a sweet spot for us is that we're still using Ruby. Ruby has a massive ecosystem of great libraries. Ruby is great at doing this kind of web programming. Um, this just lets us drag it a little bit towards static types. But you do lose out on, you know, the unsafe, for example, as a, a escape hatch is an escape hatch that can allow truck-sized problems through. Um, you know, there, there is, you could, I could write in, you know, a single line a program that treats an integer as a string, and that would just be fine. Um, and so, you know, part of the trade-off there is just it, you don't have as strict guarantees. Uh, as you have, you know, fancier and fancier type systems, like you've got Haskell, you've got Rust that can do things like use its type system to do um, 
uh, you know, memory allocation ahead of time. If, if you want to get like real, real in, uh, into this, uh, you can look at ATS or Pony, uh, which are both languages that use their type systems to give you amazing guarantee. ATS is a low level language where the type system will tell you if you've forgotten to allocate space for the null terminator in your strings. And Pony is a language that's sort of Erlang uh, actor style that will give you a, a type error if you ever have any kind of data race of any kind at all. Um, and this is amazing. Also, if you look at those languages, they're super complicated, uh, very difficult to approach. Um, and so again, you know, like th this is uh, sitting in the middle of a lot of different axes in which you get many of the benefits of static typing, you get many of the benefits of dynamic typing. Um, Just a little clarification, is, uh, when you enable typing, is this per file, per method, per? It is per file. file. Uh, it's per file, but then you have to add, uh, if I were to turn type true in a file and then never give any type signatures to it. The only thing that would really be typed at that point is a standard library and only as far as it could be. So like every method that I wrote in my code base would just be returning something, it would be treated as returning untyped, um, which is sort of the natural state of Ruby. Um, but on the other hand, if I tried writing, you know, um, a standard library method where I accidentally passed in a string instead of an integer somewhere, it might still yell at me about that. Uh, so there would be a little bit of typing. As you add more and more signatures, it'll be more and more, you know, so, th so yes, it is on a per file basis that you're opting into certain levels of typing. But, but also you could just be adding or not adding individual signatures. Uh, what's been the feedback between like sorbet typing and like duck typing? Like from, like from your team? Um, so, they actually don't, so Sorbet does not have really good support for duct typing on purpose. We actually, there are ways of doing static duct typing. By and large, Sorbet has not done them. Um, we tend to prefer nominal typing. We have found that basically nobody misses it. Um, uh, effectively, um, there is sort of a manual, you can make interfaces, there's a notion of an interface uh, or of an abstract class or so forth. And it turns out that most of the time, just creating these interfaces and including them was sufficient. And most of the time that was already the case. There was already some, you know, whatever we thought of as like the dynamic sort of duct typed interface already was being used by a mix in anyway. Just turn that mix in into the interface. And so it, in practice at our code base, it hadn't been used. I think the thing that where this doesn't speak to, and th so th this is speaking personally a little bit, not necessarily like the opinion of the Sorbet team necessarily, but my feeling is that because di duct typing is probably most useful um, <coughs> excuse me, in a library setting. Having a library that can take in an object that as long as it's given shaped as a particular thing or whatnot. Um, you know, like places where this would be very powerful in Ruby that this, you know, um, is like, say, having an IO-like object that exposes the same thing but doesn't inherit from IO. Sorbet would not play nicely with that. We also just didn't use that anywhere in our code base. But I can imagine as a library writer really wanting to have those duct type features a little bit more. Um, we right now have not prioritized adding anything like that. I don't think that we've... Um, or you know, a adding something like um, interface types that are uh, anonymous that let you do things like duct typing. Um, I don't think that it's, I, I'm not prepared to say it's never going to happen, but we haven't prioritized it just because at Stripe we've found that we haven't missed it at all. Um, do you find that there's an opportunity to work across distributed systems and of course typing, or is that like a totally different um, problem space? I think that that is sort of a different problem space than what we're, we're doing. Um, I mean, to some degree, like, there is the option of doing things like, say, having a typed protobuf interface or something like that. Um, and we do have types over various interfaces that do get traded between things, but we aren't doing things like, say, session types, which are the, the, is the sort of academic name for types across, um, across network boundaries and things like that. Um, I think that that's kind of orthogonal to what we're doing. I don't know, maybe you disagree, but that's... <laughs> Again, I'm kind of an outsider when it comes to Ruby, but like from a Java perspective, like if I want to write an interface, uh, 
how do I do that in Sorbet? Like, and then I want to pass it around to things like, kind of, you know, it's I O like it's, mm -hmm. it's read or whatever. Like, mm -hmm. Pass it in there. Like, let's go. Oh yeah, you can absolutely. You know. Yeah, sure. I mean, so you, you, you can just, you know, make a module. We have uh, a special thing that you write in there, which is interface bang, to just, you know, to convey, convey to Sorbet that this will be treated as an interface, and then you just take values of that type. Um, okay. So you would put methods in there that have no implementations, just signatures. Uh, and then when you include that, the obligation then, which is checked by Sorbet, is to define bodies for all of those uh, with the same signature. Gotcha. But so if I in this kind of use case, and maybe the answer is no, is, uh, you know, if I'm expecting something that's readable, it supports read, it has any parameters or whatever, mm -hmm. can I, as a library writer, um, export readable <coughs> if anybody passes in a thing that just incidentally happens to conform to that mm -hmm. type signature, does it work? Not no. yet. Yeah. So they, they would have to include that module into their class and implement those methods. Got it. Uh, so they have to, like, basically make a little cheap wrapper Yeah, if they wanted to adapt something existing that they didn't have control over, yeah. Okay. So here we have a readable interface. And so you can see that that has, um, oh, oh, you have the, the, the wrong scrolling. Sorry. Um, <laughs> um, so extending helpers here and then saying interface ban is what says, okay, now this module is an interface. Um, I can write a, um, I don't know why I would do this, but um, not SOG. Um, so if inside X here, X is something that is readable, so I can call read on it, and that's fine. Um, and if you pass, like. So if I pass something that doesn't have it, then it's going to say. Um, it does not does not exist. If I create um, my readable, then notice this actually has a squiggly line. That's because I have uh, exactly missing definition for abstract method. So if I do. Slippery slope to turning more modules and interfaces. To, to Ruby being, being less Ruby? I don't know. I mean, I, the point, that's the point. Less Ruby. Yeah, I, th I, th I would say yes. It is it is less Ruby-ish than it is otherwise. But I would I would also argue that the presence of untyped means that you can still have that escape hatch to do the things that you, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's it's entirely opt-in. Yeah. So so I'm sorry. Maybe some of the Ruby people. That's, when you extend T helpers, that's a method that gets defined by extending that other module. It's like so the, the yeah. dot typing thing, that's what we have. That we have dot typing. So yeah. if it responds to read, then good. It is read. So like, is there any place in normal vanilla Ruby where you specify where you specify contract like that? No. Okay. Okay. Nope. All right. no. <laughs> you could, in theory, do have like there are modules that have. A similar level, like specifically runtime typing, like sorbet, but they're not. I don't think widely used. Yeah. But yeah, so like here, I say, okay, this obviously doesn't work because f uh, five integer is not um, is not a thing. That, or, you know, f integer does not have the read method. Uh, this down here is fine, though. Actually, uh, th this is a different error this, because this needs to be static, doesn't it? So this error is going to be that uh, it expects a readable, but it has an integer, and integer is not readable. Uh, on the other hand, I do have a readable down there, so if I do foo of my readable dot new, that'll be fine. Well, not at runtime, but not at runtime. <laughs> That's fine. And also, uh, well, the it's it's used before it's defined. Um, yeah. Okay. So my readable dot read would also be a runtime error because it's returning the string foo and it's a declare this void. Is that no? It returns no. no that's, okay, yeah. Sorry. Um, but notice right here, I've done unsafe of self, 
that just means, okay, on this self, I can call anything. Yeah. It's fine. So we always have that, which is sort of, like I said, the, where we think the sweet spot is, at least that we've found. Because you have the ability to do this sort of Java style, here's all of the types, here's all of the contracts, here's all of the everything. You get advantages like this really fast turnaround for errors. You get advantages like um, having, you know, being able to investigate things. But on the other hand, you also can, if you want to, always dip back into Ruby. You can, you can always use unsafe, you can always, uh, you know, uh, you can always use, still use metaprogramming at runtime, whether you want to put a typed veneer on it or not. As in, like, we can conditionally add types to something? Yeah. I feel like you should rename unsafe to this is bad and wrong and unsafe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, we, yeah. we've got a couple of those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. We also uh, do this occasionally when we introduce new things. Back in the fall, we had a type called experimental attached class, yeah. just so that people could use it, but they knew that it was a little bit wacky. I like that. In your internal lint is unsafe a build failure? No. No, it, it, I mean, it, it gets a fair amount of use. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that's probably worth noting is that like most of our team, we're not die hard type. Like, we don't say, OK, everything must be typed now. Uh, and people will regularly come to our team and say, hey, we're having trouble typing this test. And we're like, it's a test. Who cares? Uh, does it run? Does it fail when it should and succeed when it should? Then, you know, like, yeah, in theory, it's nice for things to be typed, but types are fundamentally a tool. And that's the reason why, you know, we built this in the way that we did is because we can use it as a tool when it is powerful to be used as a tool. If it turns out to not be useful, then we can opt out of it. Like, we, we're, we're not doing this because we're like, it, it, despite the fact that we are Haskellers at one point, uh, we're not doing this because we think that types are a moral good and we're going to add them <laughs> everywhere. We're doing it because fundamentally types are, can be a useful tool and something like Sorbet allows us to use types when they're powerful and opt out of them when they are not. Are they really called Haskellers? That's yeah, Haskellers. I feel like you missed an opportunity to be called Haskell Rascalers. <laughs> Haskell. It's been a pleasure, gentlemen. I have to cut you off with a question. Oh, yeah, there. absolutely. Because we 